Hey guys, today on the show, we have none other than Mike Mortlock. This guy is someone that's pretty unique. He's got some unique data insights. Being a quantity surveyor, he's got access to investor data that nobody else has access to. Why do we care? As property investors, we need to understand where are the trends going so we can take advantage of them. So this episode is purely about where are the trends for 2023? What happened last year and what is happening in 2024 because if we can jump on the bandwagon before it happens we are in a good stead um, we're going to look at where are rents growing where are rents increasing what are the opportunities there and what about investor activity where are investors buying last year we saw a massive shift of investor activity where are they actually going to be buying in 2024 we've got fresh data hot off the press my name is joe tucker and together with jeff miles we created oz property invested australia's largest property investment community with over 65,000 members and the reason we do this is to help property investors create scalable and sustainable property portfolios without messing it up each and every week we interview top property experts throughout all of australia to become better property investors together and this week we have none other than mike mortlock who is a expert quantity surveyor with unreal data so let's jump into the session now and we are live on oz property investors we bring the big names and we have the big depreciation fun gee i don't know oh, who has ever said that before all right but how you going, Mike? What's how's your day, mate? How's your how's your studio? It's looking good. It's full of depreciation fun, Jeff. Um, <laughs> yeah, the studio, the studio is good. This is um, this is sort of my version of that Matrix scene where they sort of sit in that room because they're not quite ready to go into the real world. I feel safe here. Yeah, looks like purgatory. Looks like purgatory. Yeah, and that's you look my great safe there. place. You look great there. Look Do great. I? Thanks. In person, it's shit house, as you know. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say that, but you you oh. said it for me. You look great, you mate. Go. I'm excited for this Sorry. one. You are the king. You are the king of quantity surveying, and we don't get quantity surveyors on very often. Um, so <laughs> I think the last one was me. <laughs> it was it was but the thing is the thing that what interests me about you is that you see so many different transactions throughout mm. thousands and thousands of transactions and you just happen to be meticulously data focused which is fantastic mm. because then you keep track of all of the things that your that your clients are doing what kind of investments they're buying what kind of um you know how much they're spending on renovations how much are they not spending on renovations what kind of properties are they buying is that old is there new is there established like what are they what are they actually buying and it's all becoming some interesting data that you've um unpacked for us but that i think data also takes time to get through the system as well um like you go to rp data you go into sold section actually I'm, I'm going too deep here now i feel like you should be talking but you go into the sold section of realestate.com.au and it's like well that sold in you know october november december nothing has happened in january because the data hasn't moved from under offer to sold yet mm. um but mm. you've got straight to the point what is what if what are people owning um it's pretty quick anyway sorry so what are we talking about tonight we're not yeah, what are we no. chatting about so why are people Getting tuning on. in when so, so mike uh we are going to we'll do a quick run through so we're going to talk about the where rents are increasing average prices people are purchasing at and what it actually means um where people purchased in 2023 and we may get to how far people are buying away from their homes what the trends are looking at. And if we have time, we have an absolute treat at the end. We're going to talk about depreciation changes. So who doesn't love talking about depreciation? You certainly do, Mike. I'm not sure the audience loves hearing, but that's what that's what we run through tonight. Chef, so Chef, my, think, my father told me that sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. So you don't have to say you want to hear about I'm depreciation changes, but I think that uh, property investors might like to know about a new industry white paper, but it's my job to keep it light and fun so relax it'll be all right this is a safe place this purgatory of mine <laughs> share out we will massage your property um property yeah I don't know what we're talking about there. what are we doing but no it's going to be epic because the thing i'd love to see in here is sort of understanding where the sort of where the puck is going because we can look at the data and that will give us some indication so that's what you're going to get tonight so we're going to hear mike's sort of synopsis and you've been looking at this for what is it sort of seven to eight years how long has the data you've collated in your 13 report? years there wow you go. wow yes yeah. so so, so it's evolved 
over over the years. Um, it was limited when I first began, and every year I find some little nuance or data point that I think is in, interesting. And where, where I think I'm excited to be is that there's certain bits of data that we collect that nobody else does. Uh, so, like RP data and Core Logic and Prop Track don't collect things like post-purchase renovation spend. They don't collect things like how long does it take from someone purchasing a property to ordering a depreciation schedule or how, what percentage of investors live in their property before they rent it out. Uh, all sorts of little weird things like that that tell a little bit of a story and weave a rich tapestry of property investor behaviour in Australia. Doesn't that sound good? That was very well said. Mm. You can do our next ad. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's key. Voice radio. Yeah, that's key because uh, that it, like the, the thing that interests me is the renovation stuff because that tells me how much disposable income and access to capital people are having if they're running renovations and if it actually makes sense for them to run those renovations. What are the what are you seeing? What does that tell you? What does renovation spend tell you? Yeah, look, well, what's happened with renovation spend, and I'll see if I can uh, pull this up for uh, our people. Um, in fact, I will even show my little uh, presentation here. So just chat amongst yourselves. No. Here we go. This is going to be, this is going to have to be a window share, this one, which is clunky. But um, there you go. Chuck that on the screen for me, guys. Um, so the percentage of uh, established properties with post-purchase renovations has has dropped quite significantly from 37% in 2021 down to 21. Uh, what are we looking at? Yeah, that's that just, is. Just hit, hit plus, command plus. Yeah, Here we go. go. Here we that. go. So it's a percentage of people that are engaging in post-purchase renovations. So it's dropped the last wow. three years. So you probably that's remember that there were... There was actually a renovation boom during COVID, and I think it's important to remind ourselves what happened during COVID because there's things that we remember, like oh, I can't go to the pub, or you know things like, well, we, we actually Europe, thought. Man. I don't know about the pub. I don't go to the pub. I go, we go to Europe, man. We don't go to the pub. I mean, it's the pub. It's we like, go to Bali, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Well, let's. I've never let's been not to Bali. Above our station. Be, yeah. No, me neither. Me neither. Um, but what actually yeah. happened is that we were petrified that there could be 30% unemployment. We didn't know what was going to happen, so the household savings ratio went through the roof. And then we couldn't spend the money. We couldn't go on holidays. We couldn't go out to dinner. So a lot of people renovated because we were stuck in our homes and we looked at them and we thought, gosh, this place is awful. Uh, yeah. And another sad stat is that we also looked at our partners and decided the same thing. So the divorce rate sort of went through through the roof. So the correlation between divorces or inverse correlation between divorces and uh, and renovations. So yeah, there was a, a, a marked a marked drop in renovations. Uh, and then when it comes to the spend, you can see that's the same time period. 2021, the average spend was 30K. And in 2023, it was about half that. Um, so that's a big difference. And I think that speaks to Massive. it was an obvious boom and it's a cost of living crisis as well. It's yeah. Right. And what was it before? Like, the, like a, I don't know if you've been collecting this for the past 13 years. Like, were you collecting that data? Like what's the kind of long-term average of, of spend? Are we trending down below the average or high above the average? Like, Sorry, you know, further down. Yeah, or? look, it... it, it it's sort of broken up into two segments. So the people that occupy their property prior to renting it out hovers between 22 and 25% of people, believe it or not. When I first crunched that data, yeah. I thought that 10% of people might live in their property and then it's a rental, but it's actually closer to a quarter. So the people that were ha were occupying the property for some point in time were always spending more on renovations because you kind of think, well, they might not have had the intention for that to be a, a rental property down the track. So on average, they're probably spending around about $60,000, $50,000, $60,000, whereas the long-term average is probably twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 in, in post-purchase um, spend. Super interesting. Um, I realised, Jeff, who the hell are we talking to? Who is this guy? We've got to introduce I gonna, him. I was going to, I was going to say. So, if you've not seen Mike floating around the depreciation, that he is, you, you are an industry leader, and I, I would, I don't say that lightly. It, it does get banded around a little bit. Everybody's kind of a, a guru or an expert, but you've, you've worked, uh, you've done depreciation sort of things for for, for firms oh. such as Macca's, Canberra Airport. Gee, that's a big one. Uh, not actually, but um, Stocklands. So you've you've got a you've got a lot of 
sort of runs on the board with these sort of mm-hmm. uh, organizations. You, you've been in the AFR, realestate.com, all those sort of things. But what you are is you're all about, uh, you've got a passion. I don't know about that. That's an, that's an interesting pastime, passion for maximizing depreciation. So how, how good is that? But also outside of work, and we're talking about this before, about how you, you, you did drink five liters of water in a triathlon, which is why you now have your, your cordial water. Um, you are an elite <laughs> amateur triathlete and representing Australia, and I, I did mention that. But more interestingly I was, I was. as well. <laughs> I was, Jeff. People are going to look at that and go, that guy? With that body fat no, percentage? You're trimmed up again. I'm right? retired. Well I'm retired. But also, <laughs> you've started flying as well. So depreciation is, 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 a, is a very lucrative industry, apparently. You can sort of start to fly. In. But you are the, the pot, one of the sort of foremost experts in depreciation. But you're more than that. You are about data and collecting it and then sort of synthesizing it to help property investors because I think that's the thing that, these days, you can't simply be an accountant. You can't simply be a, a quantity surveyor. You need to what, what differentiate yourself, and you've differentiated yourself, which is why I've got you on tonight, to talk to things like where are rents increasing, where are people purchasing, and what it all still add into a nice digestible message. So that's why we yeah. got you on tonight, and that's who you yeah. are. Also, just a shameless plug into you know Mike's, Mike's business as well. The way that you go about getting a depreciation schedule is a little bit different to how other people do it. You actually send people out to site to get it done, which is not necessarily common practice, but it's the way to get the absolute maximize, maximize the deductions, um, which is just like one little thing that, that like it's the tiny little one percenters in negotiating a property, the tiny little percenters in choosing a location, which make the massive difference. It's the same with with you and depreciation, um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm keen to unpack, mate, um, because where people are renting, where affordability is tight, where where um what people are spending, like this is some investment indicators that are going to lead us as investors to go there because if rents are going up crazy, that's going to be a better yield, which means at a higher interest rate, we can actually afford to hold these properties for a little bit longer. Um, and that then can spur potentially into growth if all the other you know metrics and things are uh, in that area. Um, it, it also means rents going up, Joe, means that owner occupiers may just say, well, look, instead of me paying six fifty for rent, if I can go and buy a place for 500 550 and if I can qualify for mortgage that level, I'll, I'll yeah. go and, instead of me sort of paying my landlord, I will pay off my own mortgage. So it point. increases potential demand as well. So, and Very if supply point. sort of stays relatively low, then yeah, you're sort of right. So I think that's why some of the insights we're going to share tonight are going to be really, um, inf- really important for investors in 2024 and beyond. Okay, Let's cool. So. so you've crunched the data, you've done some data stuff. What are we covering off first? And, and why, why should, as an investor, should I care? Um, what's the first one? Well, I, I think like let, let's talk to street cred because we did an opening to 2023 last year where the market was 8.6% down and everyone was talking doom and gloom and I gave a couple of tips. I said that rental affordability was going to be a huge problem. Yeah. Tick. I um, said buy buy something now. Don't read the news. Buy something now. The fundamentals are po- pointing to positive. I did yeah. sort of say once interest rates turn around, that will put a fire under the market, but we didn't need it. I also did have a slide that said interest rates are overblown as a driver of property markets. So I feel like I jagged that um, with that little I'll one, two that. play. So, look, I'm not a property hotspotter. I'm not a property forecaster. I maintain a, a personal interest in that. My job is a tax depreciation nerd. But, of course, you know, interviewing people, having done six-eighths of a master's of property, which <laughs> looks really good on my resume, I feel like I've got enough to share at least some insights and some data. <laughs> so what's our first cab off the rank? What is the first data metric that we are we are chatting to? Because maybe rather than going into the future, let's look in the past about what let's, has happened in 2023. Yes. The past, the past informs the future, they say. They also say that past performance is no guarantee of future performance, but I think there is something um, something to share here. So let me share my screen. And I'll, mm. this one will be a window because I know you you like windows and I can zoom in for you, Joe, because obviously you're getting old. Getting um, of that age. 
Yeah, zoom in if, for that if one. You're, if you're uh, playing along at home, jump jump on our. We are on YouTube as well, so if you're not watching, jump on our YouTube now and and throw some comments on YouTube as well. So we'll have to we'll have to. Here we go. Yeah, so we, what are we talking right to here, Mike? Data and where okay, property? So we talk to so rents anecdote. No, no rents. This is where people are buying. Okay, and I think that uh, rents Basically, are part of the story. Sorry. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. People purchases increase in the ACT. Yes, yeah, like um, markedly. Um, but this story to me is really all about Perth. Anecdotally, we knew Perth was crazy. That's really why I commissioned this research. So um, at the time, this was kind of the first indication of, you know, some of the transaction amounts or values that were happening over in WA. Um, so we actually compared Q1 2022 to Q1 2023. Uh, and for the first time ever, WA rocketed into second position as the most popular state. Now, WA is a little bit peculiar in that 75% of Western Australians live in and around Perth. So I sort of say WA and Perth interchangeably. I probably shouldn't, yeah. but there's enough evidence to say that it's a pretty big whack of the state, right? So Isn't it from, similar from, to Adelaide though? Like what's the would you say a similar proportion live live in Adelaide? Very much so, yeah. yeah. I, I would say I don't have the data to hand, but I would say so, right? I mean, that's not a very big state and lots of it is very dusty. Uh, and you know, people don't go in for that. Um, WA is the same. Um, so 9.38% of investors were selecting in 20, WA. 22. Bugger all. In 2022, yeah, and that rocketed to 31.86%. So the biggest increase at 22.49% from Q1 2022 to Q1 2023. Uh, and it basically stole off every other state, right? And I think some of the big losers... You could speak to some of the policies in and around that time. So the Queensland yep. land tax stuff, that was sort of bubbling up at that particular point in time. Victoria it's crazy, it's crazy that, how much but... that, that sets the expect that, that that sets people's minds of, oh my gosh, there's a Queensland land tax, which didn't go through, by the way, but how much it actually stopped people from buying in that in that state. Yes, and I do actually have some specific data on that as well, um, and maybe I won't chuck it up on the screen. Um, no, no. But Sorry, I'll cut you but, off. <laughs> that's all right. But um, I did a presentation to Pippa uh, late last year and had a segment called Stupid Political Decisions, which I didn't know at the time the shadow housing minister was going to be um, in attendance, and I had this big picture of Dan Andrews going, yay, But and I sort of panicked, but I realised, well, no, he's on the other team. Um, but let's have a look uh, at, at Queensland for that point in time. So we actually crunched the data and shared it in a press release. There was a 98-day period where we surmised that people could purchase full well knowing that this land tax change in Queensland was going to happen, right? It was a very tight window. So we had heaps of data on the on the front end of that, but we only had 98 days sample size, but we actually thought it was quite significant. And Queensland went from attracting about 40.9% of all investment to 33.6%. So a 17.8% fall as soon as that land tax stuff was legislated. Wow. And, it, and it was legislated. It was due to come in 1 July, it was just repealed. Now, why did that sort of become part of the stupid political decisions? Well, I think because it was hopefully designed to mitigate rental affordability problems, but it actually made it worse because not only did investors stop buying into Queensland, quite a few investors sold. And, so you know, there are... Yeah. yeah, exactly. So there were plenty of data houses that shared that information. And what really gets me about that one is that it was repealed and there was some great um, lobbying work from, from people like um, Pippa and the REIQ, Antonia, uh, who's a powerhouse. But it was repealed and, and the, the reason why they said they got rid of it is not because it was a bad idea, it's because the other states wouldn't play ball and give them to the data. The data. So, for example, New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet said that we're not going to tell you what 
our New, New South Welshmen, uh, Welsh women and men. I don't know how you're supposed to say that now. Um, we're not going to share both? that data with you just so you can tax them, right? Because that was the idea. It's like, okay, if you own an investment property in Queensland, we'll tax you on that, but it will tax you on everything else combined together around the country. It was the most ludicrous thing in the world, but it changed investor behaviour and we don't have enough data yet to show that happening in Victoria t from a statistical uh, robust point of view, but I can tell you it's happening. People are avoiding Victoria like the plague. Yeah, well, that's – and, again, going back to the interesting thing about these policies, right? So the Victorian uh, land tax, I just I, – I did the calculations on a property I own, $550,000 dollar um property down there and it's it's 1200 bucks a year so that's not nothing but it's not a lot of money for me to kind of make a decision so are people avoiding victoria when there might be some opportunity down there uh for a 1200 dollar thing like you look at northern queensland for instance they have their own land tax in high council rates and high insurance rates which far yeah. exceeds a thousand dollar land tax that the government puts on top of it so it's like you've got to kind of weigh these things up and and when they come out and scare a lot of people and make people emotional maybe that's an opportunity for you i don't know that's, i think i think it's point. a good i think it's a good point the the way um just getting back to victoria the land yeah. tax stuff was on on top of some other quite onerous things like the minimum standards legislation uh, in Victoria, which, yeah, it's fair enough. It's easy to say, oh, it's an inspection every now and then and it costs two or 300 bucks or whatever. But often, yeah. you know, retrofitting the property to meet those standards can be cost prohibitive. Um, yeah. But I, I equate it to the people that say, oh, look, I'm never going to buy a remote investment property anymore because I just got an electrician's bill for changing a light bulb and it cost me $800 or something ridiculous yeah. like that. And I kind of think, all right. Maybe well, need to get another quote if that's the case, Mike. I mean, you pay too much. <laughs> Multiple quotes, rule one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but even let, let, let me put a yeah. thought experiment out to you. Let's say it costs them $5,000 to replace that light globe and they have to do it every five years or what have you. If if that investment property was picked across all of the suburbs in Australia for its investment growth potential and with that philosophy of I'm never going to buy anything remote, you're limited to a geographical area within driving distance of your house you know, there might be a 2% difference in what you can get in capital growth. So that light bulb might be worth paying $5,000 for just to get over that, you know, the pain of having to pay that amount. I think I think that's part of it, Jeff, is that people go, oh, there's new taxes, there's a new bill, and they make a disproportionate uh, decision based on the pain of the tax or the loss. Uh, people, people hate paying too much, they hate paying tax, but you do have to factor it in. It is a broader discussion and one should zoom out with an Excel spreadsheet and not have a knee-jerk reaction to things in my view. Mate, I'm absolutely with you. Um, okay, well, just before we dive deep into the rest of these um, numbers here, let's run our sponsor thing and then we'll dive deep into understanding. And like, because I see a lot of numbers here, but I don't entirely, wh why do I care kind of thing. A lot of WA's taken a lot of, um, a lot of numbers, but um, yeah, let's yeah. do it. The amazing thing with commercial property. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special announcement from the master of commercial property investing, Steve Polisi. I love commercial property. Get ready to have your minds blown as Steve is back and he's got some pretty exciting news for us. Steve is unleashing his second sensational book upon the world. And get this, for the Oz Property Investors members out there, he's giving it away absolutely free. Mm -hmm. Yep, 100% free. Yep, 100% free for all property enthusiasts who want to learn and grow on their commercial property investing journey. But he's also added a little extra chili to make this deal even spicier. With this free book, you'll also receive a complimentary one-hour strategy session with the man himself. Imagine a full 60 minutes with Steve's commercial and property genius dedicated to helping you master the intricate dance of commercial property investing. And who better to dance with the man who looks better than Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing? I don't know about that. Want to grab this offer? It's super easy. If you're live right now, click the link in the comments and secure it today. If not, grab your device, open up the browser, head over to policyproperty.com, look for the book page and grab your free copy of Steve's latest masterpiece. 
And when you're checking out, make sure to use the exclusive code OZPROP to secure the free book and also your free one-hour strategy session. My only concern with this offer is that Steve's going to have to turn it off soon as he can only do so many sessions. So if you want to secure your spot, do so today. Oh, nearly passed out there. <laughs> when too much <laughs> beer isn't enough. No, I don't. I you'd like it's that one. Good, good, good fun. So uh, what, what I would be interested to, to hear with this, and you might not have it, Mike, but do you have a trend of the starter? Because what did it look like in, in, in 2019? Because I imagine that the Perth or WA would have been even lower than maybe nine percent. Like, what does it look like over time? Yeah, um, I will. I will pull that up. But before I do that, let me give you. I promised exclusive data never before seen. Now, the, the astute amongst Ooh. you might be watching and playing at home, going January to March twenty twenty three. That's in the past. Give me something hot off the press. So oh. I'm going to hit this button, and something's going to happen. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I've got to zoom in again. Now we've changed the graphics slightly, but these are the same figures. Oh. However, on the right hand column, we have added. 42%. Oh, I have added, yes, there we go. Um, let me try and zoom in a bit more. Yeah. Okay. 3%. What, everything's, everything's gone up? No, there's no red. No. Uh, this, is, this is not a trend. This is what percentage of people are buying in WA as distinct from other places from 1 July to yesterday. So this is wow. the hottest, fastest, betterest, betterest, if that's a word, data. Yes, now, yeah, best will work. Um, so what you'll notice here um, is that WA Victoria is now, now actually on top. Um, Queensland has lost a little bit of ground but very, very popular. New South Wales has fallen off a cliff from 22% to 8%. Now, um, you asked the question, why do I care? Like what? why are we looking at this and what can we do with that information? I just hit my beep button for my swear word. Did that come through? No. Uh, I have to do it in post. Um, <laughs> there is no post. It's live, mate. <laughs> there's, there's no post? All ah, right. Um, yeah, so look, and, and you know, Victoria at 8%, it, it was 6.4%. It's gone up a little bit. So there, there will be some people that are looking at, you know, look, Victoria has under, underperformed uh, and the sentiment's pretty bad. It could actually be a pretty good time to buy. So, yeah, this is, this is sort of uh, a little bit of a longer tr uh, trend, Jeff. But if we're looking at WA over the years, so let me, let me have a... Oh, don't, no, I don't want an update. Let me go so, back to yeah. say. You, you go back. You yes, do that. Just, while I'm thinking, uh, how do we find this information? Like, is this every transaction ever completed in the state of New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland? Or is this just for it investors? Is. This is just investors and this is just, this is just our investors. So what yep. we've got is we've got anyone that's purchasing an investment uh, property and getting a depreciation schedule. Of course, that's where we get all of this juicy data. And as you yes. say, we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of people. So the transaction volumes are quite um, significant. Uh, yeah. But no, it's not. Nobody has this data really for the whole whole country, right? Because uh, it, it's a it's a messy thing to get together. And yeah, if I go back to to WW uh, for, to WA. I should say it was it was less than one percent back in two thousand uh, and eighteen, um, but wow. of course, yeah. WA has had some very very poor markets over the years, and one one should uh, never forget that the median house price in uh, WA was once higher than Sydney. Sydney. Um, yeah, so it's 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 suffered quite a bit uh, over the years, but. The prospects uh, are still actually looking good. I, I did a podcast recently talking about WA and got quite a little bit of hate mail, which is kind of interesting because I sort of I cautioned people. But the 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 fever pitch around WA for investors is is nowhere near as strong as anything that I've that I've ever seen. But you know, WA didn't grow for sixteen years. If you're buying at the top of this market, you might potentially be sitting still for quite some time. Yes, there's affordability fundamentals and those sorts of things. But I, I just I have no vested interest in it. I don't care where you buy. We'll help you out wherever you are. But I just don't like the idea of people buying the top of a of a hot market and then having to wait for their growth because the stats still do say that the average investor only owns one property, and I think that's because they get the first one wrong. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree. And, and it's also why you should buy with fat already in the in the kind of in the deal so that you've got some built in equity and you can then also be in a good market that's rising, but also not jumping in just because everyone else is, is jumping yeah. in. Um, but also if you look at, you know, where Perth's price was back in, um, you know, 2000 and 2012, it's down here and it's, it's done, it's done bugger all, but the rest of Australia has gone absolutely gangbusters. So is it, is it playing a, a quick catch up to get to more of a, a fair, reasonable price because Perth back when it was, I don't know, 400,000 back in 20, what was that? 11 or 12, right? It was a completely different world. It, it, it was just a dust bowl. You places like, you know, down South in Rockingham and up North in, in, um, Jundalap was just nothing. There was just fields galore. Now it's met, like there's proper cities in all of these areas. Mm. Um, mm. so that's also a consideration of not saying that it's going to be grow, grow, grow forever, but it's really has fundamentally changed. So what does that mean for what happens to prices? Um, you've just got to keep on top of these things. I spoke to a BA today who was telling me about another BA that was making a killing in WA and they started buying there about three or four years ago and they are actually going to make a recommendation to their clients that when they feel like it's the top of the market, which is, a very difficult thing to pick exactly, but they will be actually be suggesting that they sell, lock in that profit and even pay the capital gains tax and move to another market. Their view is that this is a, a, a short-term window, maybe that's two years, three years, four years, but after then it, it, it their expectation is a plateau. And that, like, whether that's true or not, like, I, as I say, I'm not a hotspotter. I don't crunch that that data. You need to look at a lot more data than what I look at to be able to see the whole picture but i just do worry for 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 clients that are purchasing there with the expectation that this will be a perennial performer and then they get stuck and you know they'll sit on something that isn't going to grow yeah it's the biggest it's the biggest it's the biggest fear of buying yeah. at, the, at the top for any investor but there is still, and, and, you know, referencing your point before, Joe, where it's like, okay, why are we looking at these bloody graphs, Mortlock? You know, your percentage this and percentage that, why does it matter? Well, I think what has really driven property investors in 2023, you think about the high interest rate environment we're in, borrowing capacities are, are lessened. Um, so people are investing in more affordable markets. And if I go back to my screen, I can actually tell you what the average purchase price uh, people, are, people are paying. Um, and that'll give you an idea as to, okay, well, where where are those opportunities? Where can you buy property for these prices? Now, it's either going to be left or right or this one. Here we go. Average purchase prices. You can put that up. Jeff, you seem to be the one the wow. really running this what, show. An average investment property in New South Wales, so investment is $1.12 million. That's the average of, of every transaction that we've seen in the last seven months. That is the average purchase price. Now, there are certainly uh, out, outliers in that. We do yeah. see some hyper expensive ones and that will sort of skew um, New South Wales to some degree. I think it's probably a little what's, bit what's better the to look. What's size on that anyway, Mike? Are, we, are you talking sort of hundreds or are you talking thousands? We're talking thousands, yeah. And it, it basically why, don't you do, why do you do average over median? Uh, well, we're, well, uh, essentially, we are just looking for every outlier and bunging it into a bunging into a middle together. ground. So, I mean, yeah, we can segment it any way you like, right? But I think yeah. the important takeaway from this is that the average that people are spending is six hundred and seventy three. And if you use ChatGPT, which I know you're a big fan of, uh, Joe, to remove the the outliers, such as its its statistical engine likes to do, you're, you're actually probably looking around that 560 mark across the country. Now, let's say it's somewhere around that $600,000 range that the average purchaser is paying. Where, where, that begs the question, where do you go? Where do you go that has the right fundamentals that are, that is an investor grade style property that has, you know, the right split of, of of renters versus owner occupiers. It has, you know, a, a reasonable socioeconomic score. Um, it has yeah. the affordability where the people are earning X uh, as rent. a percentage of, of the rent. Yeah, their housing costs is, is no more than say 35%. Um, so I think 2023 saw affordable markets 
um, much more in vogue. And I think, you know, Queensland and, and WA really kind of fit that bill. I think Adelaide to some degree, but it, it had had a pretty good run. Um, but WA was, yeah, at the bottom of that, that cycle there. So I think that's really my big takeaway from what happened in 2023. Well, people went into affordable markets. Um, we saw a huge rental crisis, and I think that's going to play out politically in 2024 in the lead up to the 2025 federal election and some state uh, elections. So to me, it's all about that that rental affordability and that that price point affordability. So well, do you I, see I, I a, similar, a similar trend going forward? I mean, I, I'm sure we're going to mention the 2024 predictions, um, but do you see a similar trend? Like what changes do you see from last year into this year? I, I think um, we need to talk about the interest rates as the elephant in the room. And I did sort of say that interest rates are a little bit overblown in the way that they can manipulate property prices. But I do think once we start seeing some cuts, we will get uh, a little bit of extra fire under the bottom of the property market. That will be balanced by stock. It's probably early days, but we've seen a bit of an uptick in, in stock availability. And when we look at stock over um, 2023, it's well below the five-year uh, average, right? So things kind of really weren't uh, transacting. But the Westpac, for example, uh, are predicting the first cut to be September this year with the recent inflation data and the December figures and the business investment stuff that's come out in the last couple of days. It's pointing to an almost guaranteed hold rather than uh, an increase and, and perhaps shut the door on future increases. This, this might be the top. Um, whereas, you know, maybe a week ago even we were thinking there could be another one or maybe two. Now the consensus is more like this could be actually the peak of the cycle and instead mm. of being in the arse end of 2025 to get into that target band, we could be actually seeing it uh, a little bit sooner than that. What, earlier than 2025 for the target? Yeah, to Jesus. be in that 2 to 3% target band. Yeah, wow. and I, I think they they won't they won't want to sort of just see it for one month. They want to see it consistently there because one month is not a trend, right? Because it could it could it could sort of jump around. It could be very could be quite volatile because we don't know what's. I mean, a, a point that a lot of people keep mentioning is you don't know what's going to happen in in places like um, so the Middle East and and even sort of Ukraine, Russia. That could sort of start to heat up again, and if that heats up, then then it's supply still going. chains could still going, still happening. Yeah, exactly. Like, but it could the heat news up again. Has turned like, off of it. Got yeah, no news about well, it. If, yeah. If if, the, if it gets happening. a little bit more sort of spicy and there's blockades and lots of stuff, then yeah, inflation could I, could tick up again. I think I think the um, the Russia Ukraine conflict has has probably shown us its influence on uh, economics globally. Um, and you know, I've studied property economics, but not economics per se. I'm just more of a student of that. Um, but the um, the Israel-Palestine broader, you know, Yemeni-Iran um, conflict Syria. probably has a lot more uh, potential impact because that's, yeah, that's getting quite serious and hot over there. And then we've also got that that uh, sleeping giant of, of China looking... Um, to their little neighbour up to the sort of right-hand top corner and whether they might sort of sneak in there and what the international response would be. But, like, all of that political uh, environment and all of that uh, the COVID supply chain stuff, if you stick that all into one uh, into one bundle, uh, we saw huge increases in, in material um, movement costs and shipping costs. That has all really gone back pretty much to normal international shipping, apart from, you know, the, the Houthis and um, the Red Sea ship attacks. But I think that's only 20% of, of global shipping, which is significant, but not like COVID where ships just weren't moving, yeah. right? So that, that really caused a big problem for um, construction costs. Now construction costs materials have, have really moderated. Uh, however, right. construction labour is a big problem. And that, I think, is an important uh, consideration for 2024 as well because... Politicians have been saying ad nauseum that we're going to build 1.2 million homes in five years. Um, what they're saying is that we've done it once, one year, but we want to string five of them together and we want to do it at a time where interest rates are high and the um, 
Property Council of Australia and I think the Urban Development Institute of Australia are saying that, you know, there's a there's a 4% decrease in construction activity with every 100 uh, basis point increase in interest rates. And then we've also got a huge labour shortage in the construction sector. And the other one that people don't necessarily talk about so much is natural disasters. I, I find it very difficult to keep up with what's happening. Is, is Are we on fire or are we flooding? It sort of seems you can go from one to the next. Mother Nature is very angry. And whether you believe in climate change or science, um, oh I think it's important to understand that the impact of these, um, these catastrophic events is that it pulls construction labour away. On top of that as well, we've also got a huge commitment to infrastructure spending um, from state and federal governments as well. So the, the, the end, if I can tie a bow around that in a way that makes Jeff um, happy, th they've got Buckley's chance of sorting out that housing supply problem. So that's where property investors, I think, are actually part of the rental affordability solution because we're not going to be able to build that fast. And at the end of the day, it takes a long time to build things. If we disincentivize investors and we talk about rental caps and no cause uh, evictions and and scrapping negative gearing, which will definitely raise its head again. It's just going to make people opt out of property investing at a time where we can't afford that as a nation. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know about your thoughts on, but I think that the the media is going to start to see a shift for investors. Like right now, investors, well, for the past eternity, investors have been the devil and, and you know, they're just trying to profit off of things. But I think it's now becoming very clear that supply is the problem and the government hasn't got a solution to the supply problem. And investors are the only ones that are going to help do this. And you're already seeing it in, in incentivizing the granny flat situation. Queensland, then uh, Victoria, WA has just changed some rules about um, granny flats. South Australia, it's all changing to increase this supply and to the people to increase the supply, not the councils. It's not the government. It is relying on investors to be able to give people give people houses because not everyone can still... afford a $700,000 no. house. No, that's true, but we still also have political parties that are blocking housing initiatives until they get rental caps reg legislated and those sorts of things. So not everybody is on that same no. page, unfortunately. No, no, but I think for me, Definitely I think I see, you'll see that sh you'll see a shift in the media a little bit, but not enough to fundamentally make a make a difference. I don't know. That's my my. I, thought, I think you'll actually see a shift the other way. I think there'll well, be a, keep there'll be a push feeding on investors. First homeowners. They'll be like, it's not affordable. The affordability thing will come back. But yeah. I want to get back to those numbers, Mike. I want to get back yep. to mm. before we move on to, um, because if I've got a budget of 400 or 450 or 500, I'm just looking at that now because not everybody can afford a 600K investment property. Like what? what is the answer to, maybe we can't come up with an answer, but what does somebody do who has that sort of budget? Do they just not buy? Like what is the, how do they, how do they get, how do they find, get their way into the investment or buy their next investment property? What have you sort of yeah, seen looks, with that? Some people, I've heard buyers agents before say, you know, if your budget isn't 800K, come back when you have 800K and they just sort of won't touch it, right? But right. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bloody big country with all sorts of diver, different fundamentals and there's still plenty of opportunities for investments sub 600 in houses and you know, sub 500 in units that, that tick a lot of investor fundamentals. So um, I was having a chat to Mr. Lardner, a friend of mine, on this particular subject, um, and he's actually um, given me a list of 10 uh, SA2 regions that he sees under 600K that meet his investor score criteria. So we're talking places like uh, Griffith in the Riverina, uh, Tumbarumba in the Riverina as well, Cobar, which is far west, um, Wagga Wagga, um, Young, Scone, Leeton, New South Wales is obviously well represented in this particular um, right. list. And then when we're talking um, units, I mean, there, there are still actually locations in WA that have um, extreme affordability. But again, those those big those big regions, which are kind of like the big smoke of the country. So say, for example, um, Dubbo, you know, it has a unit median price of, of 455, right? And um, when it comes to housing, I think we're talking around about 32% um, housing cost 
um, and, and a, an investor score of, of 83, according to Mr. Lardner's um, Secret Herbs and Spices, right? So that is the kind of place where everyone kind of goes to Dubbo because people will live disparate all around that region, but it's kind of the, the city of uh-huh. that region sort of thing. So um, if people just kind of want to turn off and watch um, Netflix, then I think there's plenty of opportunities in the regions. I wouldn't be waiting, you know, to have eight, nine hundred thousand dollars to buy an investment property. There are so many regions out there um, with such great fundamentals is that it's just a matter of looking for them and doing your due diligence on them. Would you buy a uh, a unit in Dubbo? I'm not a real unit man, right? So this, the units are really into this list because to meet all of those fundamentals sub 500 you can't get much land for that so yeah you can still buy houses you know sub 500,000 in many many places across the country but they might be too high a percentage of renters versus owner occupiers the housing affordability stress might be a little bit too high the CFA index might be a little bit too low so um, that's why that lens is on there. Um, but, yeah, I much prefer um, houses and, and a bit more of a land-to-asset ratio personally. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you with that. Um, but it's not to say, like, um, when I was first investing, I almost bought a, a unit because it just made sense. Like, I hmm. was buying it. Someone actually passed away in the unit and they tore – they were in there for weeks – after the you know the that and then they had to remove the kitchen the every single all the carpet the the um skirting boards the whole place was completely bare and i could buy it for eighty thousand dollars less than what it was worth and i would have spent you know 25 grand on a renovation so everything is investment worthy if you can at the right price everything has a mm. everything has a price and it depends on where, where your strategy is and what you're trying to achieve and you can make money in units you can make money in townhouses but it's yeah I, for a long-term fundamental hold i think you're going to get more value out of a house with with land because land is what soaks up the economic activity of an area um and if you've got a good proportion of land to asset you're going to do all right um and yeah some- absolutely yeah, development potential. And, and we were t- talking uh, off air about um, the difference in houses versus uh, units. Units of uh, were very, very popular in 2017, 18. It was almost like a 50-50 right. split for investors. Really? But now it's a, around about 16% of investors are purchasing units rather than houses. Um, Why we is saw that, a lot do you of, think? Well, Why? there's a, a lot of reasons for that. I Probably. think... Um, COVID is probably one of the big ones. You've also got Opal Towers, Mascot Towers, you know, cladding. And, yeah, the the one-bedroom apartments, we actually saw double-digit vacancy rates in some of our CBDs during COVID. Like people talk about crisis levels of of accommodation and vacancy rates. There was a time where I knew a um, property management firm in Victoria that converted to a sales firm because all of their investors wanted to sell during COVID because they couldn't rent them out. These are, you know, off the plan, high rise apartments and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and, and when you look at, um, if I look at the data from 2019 to 2023, I've got the average price that people are paying. So between 2019 and 2023, um, we saw an increase in 20 of 25% for houses. So people are paying 25% more than they were in two, 2013, uh, 2009 for houses, whereas units only 11% more. So uh, units really, really underperformed. And during COVID, there were a few people that were brave enough to sort of say, look, I actually think that this is this is sub construction cost real estate that we can get in these units. And once the uh, international student tap comes back on and say international migration comes back on, you know, I could be sitting on something here. So, I mean, it's not for the faint hearted, but there's money to be made in units. But for me, it's those those boutique small block of units that that people have done, you know, quite well at. And if you've only got a certain amount to invest, it does beg the question, do you wait for that blue chip asset? Do you wait for that house? I don't think you necessarily need to. I think if you're clever about it and you're not buying from one of those, run to the back of the room at this seminar and we'll give you 10% off and um, you know a free consultation with a bearded chap, 
nah, I shouldn't do that to Steve. He's not Please. a spruker. <laughs> Um, if you're not buying that off the plan rubbish, which Steve definitely doesn't sell, um, then then there are ways to make money. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So in, in terms of rents, you're seeing some shifts in the rental the rental data. Um, mm. What what are we looking at for 2024 rents? And where what does the data look like that you have? Because he might not have 2024. Oh, well, yeah. 23. Well, yeah. Where's the shift? <laughs> well, um, one thing that we shared to the media very uh, recently was the hardest postcodes to find a rental. So what we did is we looked at the uh, the suburbs because it's sort of easier for people to understand that um, had a hundred rental properties active in it. So as per the ABS, there were a hundred rental properties in there, and we looked at how many properties were advertised in those locations in December 2023, right? So it's it, anyone can go and look at the vacancy rate for a suburb. This was a little bit of a different kind of spin on it and a different take on it, right? And what we also um, found with this research is that a lot of these rental properties don't even get advertised, right? Because yeah. people will register, I'm looking for this sort of property and they've got 20 groups before it even goes online and, and perhaps right. doesn't even go online. Um, so if anybody wants a copy of that data, I can actually give you a little magic link um, to share, which I'll place. Oh, I can't even put it. it in the chat. I think I can put it I'm in sure the private Jeff, chat to you Jeff, guys. Yeah, and put it in the private chat, Jeff, pop it in. But Jeff, do you want to share it right now to give us a? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on the screen. Go yeah, on, chuck it up there. Let's, let's see what we can do. Treaters. Uh, window. Here we go. This will be another zoom in jobby. So this is the hardest postcodes to find a rental. And Jeff, you'll be able to throw that on the screen. Hopefully, and while you're doing that, I'll zoom in because Jeff needs his bi bifocals, or Joe needs his bifocals. <laughs> you got I it. Like that. There we, we go. go. Hardest post goes to find a rental. Look at that! Isn't that lovely? Thank you, Canva. Now, um, it depends on the region that we want to look at, um, but let's say we're looking at Greater um, Sydney. These were the hardest points. So, if I zoom in even a little bit more, or can you guys see that? All right. Oh, yeah, zoom. It, it, we, I can see it fine, but whether the audience feel watching. <laughs> My eyes are good. Don't know about everyone else's. <laughs> they can get a copy of the PDF using that uh, that link. So if you want it, you can absolutely get it. So you know, well, places Lawson, like look at that. That's, there you go. Lawson's my hometown. That's where I was. Uh, that's where I lived most of my life. There you go. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Well, only only four places listed for rent in the two seven eight three. Uh, postcode in, in December, um, so pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tight market. Um, if we're going to New South Wales regional, this is where I think there are opportunities for investors. Now, this is just looking at December 2023, and many of these um, postcodes are bigger, some are larger, so that you know plays with the percentages. But I mentioned a place like um, Dubbo recently. Uh, yep. A few moments ago, um, yep. you know, two properties advertised for rent um, in, wow. in December. Um, two even in places, Jesus. yeah, it, yeah, in well, the in the two three five seven postcode, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't cover um, all, all of the postcodes are double, but just looking at those particular postcodes, uh, and you know, places in West Lake Macquarie in in uh, in Newcastle, um, I've even seen you know, Taralba hitting 15% um, plus rental growth, which is, you know, an area that people might be uh, familiar with. It's not far from Warners Bay, but it's the West Lake. Um, so places in Newcastle and just outside of ACT as well, um, Victoria and the greater Melbourne area, the Yarra Ranges uh, has taken the lion's share of, of the tightness there. Um, Victorian Regional, Geelong, I mean, Geelong is certainly a tight rental market. Are there growth drivers and fundamentals there right now? That's a bigger story, right, and probably outside the scope of this. Um, but I think these tight rental markets are a good opportunity for investors to look because, of course, eventually we hope that things might settle down. So for 2024, my, my prediction is that um, vacancy rates won't be quite as tight uh, and the increase in rents won't be quite as large. Now, why? None of the fundamentals point to me that there, are gonna, there is going to be a greater supply of rental properties. But let's just run a little bit of a thought experiment. Let's say that rents go up uh, to a median of 
$2,500 a week across the country. Nobody's going to be yeah, able I'm, to afford that. A couple of people month, will afford mean. that. What's that? Yeah. What do you mean? Do you mean per week or you mean per month? Per week. Per yeah, week. crazy right? number. It can't. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm throwing it out there, Jeff. Stay yeah. with me on okay. this one. It, it can't happen. People can't absorb that. And I think we are reaching the limits of the absorption as well. So it gets to a point where people will actually change their behaviour. So what will they do? I believe they'll stay longer at home with their parents where they can. I believe they're more likely to rent out a room. I believe there will be um, these these higher density style developments that become more attractive like boarding houses or community houses. Um, I just don't think this pace could necessarily grow. I think all the fundamentals are as bad as they were in 2023 for rental supply, but I do think that the household formation rates, which I think are at about 2.8 or something like that, are likely to increase. So that's my biggest tip, but I, I can't see us going back to a 2%, you know, vacancy rate nationally um there's 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 just no way that's going to happen so what's going to what so things just people just stay at home and and we they can't push the prices up they just they just can't push the rent prices too crazy yeah look we're, we're sitting at a 26 year high of um of wages growth right so so certainly the capacity to to spend more um, has has eventuated, but also, also that's in an environment where interest rates have gone up and rents have gone up almost in, in concert, right? But, yes, there will be a point where mm. things just become um, so difficult for people that they make different decisions about their housing, that they are doing under duress rather than this is what I want. I might want to yeah. live in a two-bedroom place, but now I'm, I'm just saying I can't afford it. I move into a two-bedroom place. The person that's in the two-bedroom place two is bedroom like, or any this... or something like that. So... Yeah. Well, that's what it's, I was going to exactly. say. What kind of assets then, as an investor, where's the opportunity, right? Um, mm. You know, what would you say to what would you say to that? Hey, I'm an investor. I want to. I want to buy. Um, I want to go where people want to rent. What, what does it kind of look like? Yeah, look, and that's where um, in some of those locations that I was sharing before in that sort of top 10, you know, sub 600, sub 500, um, it's the affordability metric that I think is key. Once you get above sort of 35, 40% of your wages going to your housing, that's where you're going to find some resistance. So I would be looking for those markets that have that level of affordability built in that still have that tight vacancy and just people can afford for it to go up and still pay it how do we do those numbers like if you could just give a quick snapshot of like what, what should we look at abs data and say great you earn this much a week and then rent yeah. is this much or how yeah. would you do it yeah, you can definitely look at ABS data for, you know, particular um, SA2 or SA3 regions so you can see, you know, the average income and then you can just look at the median rents uh, and that will give you that sort of differentiator. Um, but there's plenty of that data to be sourced out there and, uh, you know, speak to your local buyer's agent or property statistician. Statistician. <laughs> so, okay, what you're telling me is affordable assets are going to become more popular because people are uh, – this. the rent was at 400, it's now gone to 500, it's now gone to 600, and these people can't keep pushing the rates, the rents up. But, okay, granny flats are becoming more easier in Victoria, Queensland, WA. Like maybe there's a bit of an opportunity in those type of assets, do you think? Yeah. Look, I, I mean, I always worry about the long-term capital growth of um, like a dual lock property like a granny flat because it doesn't always necessarily appeal to an owner-occupier and I always think it's good to appeal to as broad a spectrum as you can. Now, is that different with the working from home revolution? It, probably to some degree. We've, I think we've already seen in the data that the working from home honeymoon period has ended. Um, I've heard executives say, um, if you want a job, work at home. If you want a career, come to the bloody office. Um, and I think really? we've seen that pay out. Um, uh, every and, and single I, time, every single time I get on the train to go to the city, from from Cronulla to the city, more and more and more people are on it. Every single time, like every single every single week, there's another person, another person. Everyone wants everyone in the office now. When they spent, you know, I don't know. 
hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for office space. And also you can't get as you can't get it done. Like you can't get as much work done when everyone's remote. And I know blah, 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 everyone, you can do some stuff. But yeah, I'm with you. I'm starting to see that. I'm seeing a lot of that shift. And I imagine everyone else is as well. We've seen an uptick in productivity recently, but we we are sort of in the midst of a productivity crisis as well. So wages have been been going up. As I mentioned, it's sort of like a quarter, um, a, a, a you know, quarter of of a century um, high of of wages growth. Admittedly, off a pretty stagnant base. Um, so but productivity we, is down. Should, should we look to where the areas of wage growth is going? Like, if wages are growing in particular areas, does that not mean they have more capital to spend, which means they can afford to spend more on rent and spend more on? Mm capital assets like yeah property. and another way of putting that is to look at, at the employment opportunities which is a traditionally massive driver of property markets right there's 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 tens possibly hundreds of individual drivers of of growth in in property markets but employment opportunities are absolutely key and that kind of ties into infrastructure projects as well right now not all infrastructure is created equally certain ones will have a short time horizon and won't be very labor intensive some of them you need a lot of boots on the ground and they will be a long uh period for those sorts of constructions you know think inland rail and and stuff like that um so yeah absolutely where there are locations where there are a diverse range of employment opportunities where people can earn a reasonable wicket you'll see that borne out in the data and that will impact that affordability score what percentage of their household income is going Mm -hmm. to their housing costs yeah 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 well said um okay I'm loving this, mate. Mate, you got some. You've got some unique insights. You know, you treat us. You treat us every time you get on. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I I hope you're as excited as as I can be, and and I come at to, at it from a different uh, angle. I think to most people in this space, right? Because I'm not a buyer's agent. I can't tell you where to go and buy a place. I won't. I have a private interest in that, but I can't sell anything. So all I have is really observations, and with my data. Mm. With, with MCG, it's what people bring me. So in the past, people have sort of said, oh, you did this post about, you know, nearly half of people are buying in units. So why are you convincing people to buy units? I'm like, whoa, I think you got this wrong, Sonny Jim. People are bringing me this stuff and I'm just telling the world what people are buying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what people are doing. You can make your own assumptions. But, you know, looking at the data that you had for, for Perth, in 2019 and 2020, 2022, three and four, it's very interesting to see what areas have boomed with investor activity. Are you seeing um, more, inv- like uh, there used to be 70, 30, like it's typically 70, 30. Are you seeing a larger increase from owner occupiers to investor activity now? Because everyone, I mean, we run an investment group, right? So all we talk about all day, every day is property investment. But are you seeing a more and more, everyday people just getting into property investment, um, which is shifting that from 30 to 70, or is it is it still similar? We don't really sort of like have a ticker box if you're a normal person sort of thing, right? We, I don't know what my clients earn, for example. You know, sometimes I see their email address sort of be joe.tucker at ato.gov.au and I shit myself a little bit um, and I just <laughs> carry on and go, no, everything's fine. Um, but... And, it, I mean, the data is really saying that the percentage stays very, very similar. Over, I, I think we're probably talking at least 60 years, if not 100 years, that really? you know, around that, that third of people will be, um, will be renters. That doesn't seem to change. Um, and, you know, I think housing affordability is far too focused on the first home buyer, right? First yeah. home buyers, I, I think, are an important cohort. We want people to invest uh, in their future. We want them to have a safe and stable place uh, to live. I'm not saying that renting isn't that, but as Australia, we kind of have decided that housing is a goal, home ownership is a goal, and and with you know we pile on all of these incentives for first home buyers, and that's great for the people that get those incentives, but it also inflates prices a little bit. So the people that miss out on that tranche, well, it's just got a little bit harder for them. And, and no matter what we do, those numbers don't really tend to change. I think what we um, what is a bit peculiar about the current situation is uh, 
international migration. It's high, right? You've probably seen some of the numbers. And, and migrants tend to, to rent for a couple of years before purchasing. The data sort of bears that out. So, so that could certainly see, with that influx of new arrivals hitting that the rental market, that we might see a higher proportion of rentals. But there's a shortage of, of rental properties, right? So that's the, that's the sort of mm. issue that we have. But before we start complaining about immigrants like we're 60-year-old Soviet cab drivers, um, there was a housing crisis before international migration became a big thing. We had we had a shortage of rental properties beforehand. So I don't think oh. it's it's simplistic enough to blame it on, you know, new entrants to the country. Uh, I don't think I don't think that's a fair I don't think it's fair to do. Um okay, there's a cup there's some more data points to chat to I think and there's a whole bunch of questions that I would love to us uh, for us to tear through. So let's um let's jump into this thing and then we'll um dive into that. There's nothing worse than going into a situation unprepared, especially when that situation is purchasing one of the most expensive assets of your life against a trained property expert in the form of a real estate agent. It's a scary thought, but it is a skill that can be taught. Do you want to learn how to become fully prepared when buying a property so you can get out there, buy your dream home or investment property without the fear of actually messing it up? Scott Agate, the founder and expert property negotiator at Hello House, has been helping people buy their properties by stepping in and negotiating with the agents and saving his clients tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars. Scott has now decided to share all that he's learned over the past 28 years in real estate so you can go out there and do the exact same thing on how to find a property, analyze that property, negotiate on that property and transact on it to get the best results. He's created the Get Buyer Ready course, which is a step-by-step -step guide on how you too can become an expert property negotiator. It's the easy way of how you can avoid all of these agent games and get the best purchase price on that dream home or your investment property. The course is in short bites for busy people with no fluff at all. Just all the information you need to get buyer ready and secure that next property with confidence at the best price. Scott has been kind enough to give our community a massive discount with the link below. Sign up today before you even think about putting an offer on that next property and it will be one of the best decisions you ever make. Oh, you guys disappeared for a minute. Not as good a beard, as Scott, um, as uh, Polisi, but uh, no less a champion. Got to, got to agree with yeah. that. Got to agree with that. Okay. Um, okay, so how would you, how would you, how would you kind of summarize our twenty twenty three, and what are some things we should look for in 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 twenty twenty four, going forward for our, our mm. wonderful investor community. Well, hopefully we'll look to some relief in the interest rate space. Uh, Stephen Kukulis, uh, the kook, the clue is oh, in the, the name kook. sometimes. Oh, he gets, he gets <laughs> uh, destroyed on Twitter, poor bloke. Yeah, he's been, he's been calling for a cut for uh, a long time. Um, but I think the economic consensus is that it's not going to be March. And, in fact, there's some March uh, inflation data that they're going to want to be looking at. But hopefully we see that in the back end of the year. Um, but, you know, like people shouldn't be waiting for that to decide on whether to purchase in property because if we go back to this very live that we did roughly the same time at the start of 2023, you know, the property market had declined by 8.6%. I mean, it's so easy to, to forget that, right? Like it was absolutely crazy, that that bottom of the market. Um so look, for, for 2024, I expect that the trends to kind of continue. Rental affordability will still be a major issue. I don't think it can go as, as hard as it has. I think people will change their behaviour, but I think all the fundamentals are there. And I worry about state intervention into housing. Um, I haven't seen any uh, eloquent or well thought out policies that made me feel confident in the property knowledge of our state or even federal politicians. And that is a, a big worry for me. Uh, of course, um, personally, we might kind of think, all right, well, we've got investment properties. If there's less of them, it just puts more pressure up on rent. You know, that's kind of great, but I don't think it's necessarily great for society. Um, and I think affordability will still be a main focus. Let's say we get a September rate cut. 
you know, rates are still quite a lot higher than the, those old 2% loans that are coming off that five-year fixed term, right? So we're not going to see a huge uh, reprieve there. So I, I think affordability and, and looking at those tight rental markets, that's where uh, investors can, can have some, uh, some, some great opportunities. Yeah. And you can do all that research yourself, right? Like you don't need any kind of special tools. You've just got to kind of dig into dig into real estate, dig in dig into domain. Um, what I am also finding is on real estate and domain, they have like a median house price, sorry, a median rental price, and it's just nowhere near the reality of what things are actually listing for, unfortunately. So you do mm. have to kind of dig into the what type of asset am I purchasing, three bed or four bed, and then go through and see see what those prices are but yeah if, if an area has a whole heap like what you did with the postcodes um there's not many there's a thousands of properties there and there's only four rentals wow that's that's interesting why is there only four mm. people renting four people out of the entire suburb are renting their houses that uh, might spell opportunity mm. yeah Oh, I think the um, the other thing that people um, da data is fantastic. I love data. I, for me, I'm I'm a big fan of actually speaking to the people who are at the coal faces in your property managers, and if you can, yep. yes, visit the location because you really need to because Very the, the data can say one thing, but if 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 affordability is starting to really hit a like put pressure on people, and you can see it a little bit in ABS data. ABS data is fantastic, but it is lagging now. You're probably Four two, years, three right? years. Yeah, so it's lagging. So rents have probably gone up sort of a good amount and incomes may have gone up. So if it's speaking to your property manager, they will see what's happening, how many sort of applications are getting, the quality of those as well, because it's all going to be able to say, yes, there's only two or three rent properties available. But now it's rents have gone up 200 bucks in the last 12 or 18 months. How much more can the average person sort of in that suburb continue to pay for rents? And it mm. has that sort of meta ceiling. Is there a ceiling on those rents? And, and also, that I what... think is a is a key takeaway. Hopefully, is that the there's there's only so much people can afford to pay. It can't go up forever. We can't have okay, a median rental thousand. price of two and a half grand. No. Yeah. Have, no. Having Sorry, a Joe? property around the corner, seven hundred and fifty dollars a week, which doesn't sound a lot, but I live down the Illawarra, and, and you sort of it's not a whole heap, but for the area. And I just think, well, wow, that's starting to get up there a little bit, um, just, to, just for where we are. So right, what are, are your thoughts on – so let's jump to some of the questions here. Do you expect growth to continue in WWE? No, I'm WWE. WWE. <laughs> you said it before and it's got me, got me good. I did, um, yeah. A, do you see price – yeah, do you see price growth? Do you expect growth to continue in WA? Um, oh, that's WCW or something. That's I don't know WC. my wrestling. WWF. Music, right. WWE. Uh, do, do I expect it to continue to grow? Well, it depends on the time frame, right? I, I, I think once the cycle is over, we might have um, a relatively stagnant market for quite some time. And, and you know, I preface this by saying I'm, I'm not a hot spotter. I'm just looking at trends, my own interests, my own studies um, and, and the data that I look at because I'm a weird guy with no social life. Um, I think 2024, um, we're still going to see Perth um, being in probably the top three um, capitals. I, I, I think I'd be pretty comfortable in saying that's likely to happen. It could very, very well be number one. How long does it go? I don't know. Um, I worry about the fever pitch. I, I worry about some of these things that I see, you know, people talking, uh, buyers agents talking to each other, which I get a look behind the curtain sometimes saying, you know, do you guys getting frustrated that we're putting these properties forward to clients and there's just someone playing, you know, crazy money and we're missing out and, you know, I'm not prepared to, to go over what I think the fundamentals are. And, and when you kind of see that, you know, that kind of that kind of worries, and I think some of the it worries me. You know, some of the the venom when people sort of question the Perth market, um, they, there's there's they seem to have like a bit of a sunk cost uh, mindset or a bit of a confirmation bias. But I, I think it's it's likely got quite a bit longer to run. I worry about you know the fundamentals over say the next two to ten years. Um, but I think you could still there's, there's still buying opportunities. But you know if you think about WA, it's the size of bloody Europe, right? Um, so it depends where you're talking. But there there probably are markets that are oversubscribed where, you know, the amount of, um, of investors compared to owner occupiers is getting to that point where it's damaging to that location because owner occupiers tend to sort of 
gentrify is not the the best word, but um, they tend to spend money on their homes in a way that that property investors don't. And we see that in our own data. If people live in their investment property, they spend double than what they do if it's a pure rental uh, from day one. So you've got to keep an eye on that. So um, it's important to find those pockets. So WA on paper, who knows, it might do 7 or 8% next year, but there's, there's got to be places that can do double digits. I do believe that. Yeah, and also it's 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 not fair to look at the you know the Perth had fourteen years of stagnation. History does not re- repeat itself word for word. Just because one one market had a long stagnant period doesn't mean it's going to have a long stagnant period exactly the same. Um, mm. They do not all market Sydney, uh, Queensland. They kind of rhyme and they have a bit of reason to them, but they're not exactly the same as as. Great. So this one had this amount of period. Great. Let's move on to the next one and um, and do those sorts of things. Mm. Um, but but one of the things I think you just I was chatting with someone about an area that that I thought was oversubscribed with investors, and I was having a chat with an agent about it, and I said, you know, th- this area I'm hearing it all online, and I'm like, I don't believe it to be like it just doesn't stack up. It does not a good area. Don't feel good about it. Um, you know, the fundamentals, the analysis, the boots on the ground. I did all of that stuff. The data looks good, but I I didn't feel good about it. Um, and I was chatting with agents about their their kind of like exactly what Jeff was talking about. Property managers speak to the experts in the area, and um, I was like, who are you dealing with, Mister and Mrs. Agent? Who who are the what's what's the market makeup? Uh, are you dealing with you know the market's made up of seventy percent owner occupiers and thirty percent investors? Uh, is that the makeup? And she said, no, it's inverse. I'm actually dealing with seventy percent buyers agents, and I'm like, oh god, okay, and. Um, 20% investors and 10% owner occupiers. So mm. there is 90% owner occupiers that, that sorry, 90% investors that are buying in this rubbish market. But I hear yeah. it being spruiked all the time. Like no one is pushing up the value of that property except for investors. And then as soon as somebody says, you know what, we're not buying there anymore. Everyone just rips out of the market. And unfortunately you're going to be the last one holding the bag. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's like the like GameStop, right? But it's a less right. liquid thing, so it can't be as crazy as that. But yeah, like what are the fundamentals that are pushing it? Is it just this sentiment, and is it just this this bull run? And and I've got to say that um, the the cottage industry that was buyers agents is not a cottage industry anymore. It's a big business, and there are a lot of people in there that are getting paid on transactions, right? And yeah. I think you've got to be careful to make sure that you're picking one that is is ethical and doing the right thing for you i'm not trying to badmouth any particular people or buyers agents in general i believe very strongly in the value proposition that they bring but what i also believe in is incentives you put good people um, in a position where they're incentivized to make gray decisions like should i buy this people do get pushed towards the incentives. And when, you know, there are buyers agents that are having to do 30, 40, 50 transactions a month to get things done, you want to know, like, are they putting their absolute best uh, asset in front of you? Would they buy it themselves? So I just encourage people to push people harder. And a bit like you were saying, Jeff, you know, the boots on the ground, it's interviewing the local people, talking to the property manager, talking to the local council, talking to the mayor, you know, talking to the people that have lived there forever, talking to the you know, to the local, I was going to say um, something that I shouldn't, the local fish and chip proprietor, you know, those sorts of people are are invaluable. And don't spend more research uh, time on your mattress or your television. Consider the value of what you're you're about to, to give away. These investment properties, you know, the data we've got is saying 650 grand. You deserve to spend the time. If you're not going to employ an expert, you don't want to have spent more time, you know, figuring out the pixels per square inch of your LED TV. Um, obviously, I don't research TVs. I don't think LED is a thing anymore. Um, but, yeah, not? look, you've got to take it seriously, OLED yeah. or whatever. Well, and, and this is why I say to people all the time, it's like if you put a full-time, this is why this whole group exists because we want to show you that, you know, this is how we built our wealth through through property. This is the things that we've done. We put a full-time effort into it. But just like anything, if you put a part-time effort into something, you'll get a part-time result. So do not do not put a part-time effort into it. Put some spend hours doing this stuff because you'll get a better result. 
Um, I see it all the time where people just want the easy route out. They take the easy route. Um, you are in control of your financial uh, future. You've got to take it, grab it by the, you know, the whatever you want to grab by it by. By the horns and run over it. By the horns. Um, let's next, get some questions next, up. What state is next? I want to say that is what a good state question. Is next? What uh, state is know. next? What do you reckon? That's... Where are you putting your money right right now, Mr. Mike Motlock? We know <laughs> what affordability state is, is next. Yeah, 650 grand is what you've got to spend. You don't have to spend all of it, but if you wanted to, you mm. can. 650 can, house can I, established. Can I ask, Mike, um, and you might not have enough mm. data. I know you brought it up sort of before, maybe up to the end of January, but can I ask, what sort of, what does the, what the numbers look like over the last six months? You might not have that, but can you see a bit of a shift in, in, in states? Because can we sort of start to see a bit of a trend forming for somewhere else? Yeah, well, we can actually see the, the trend really just continuing. Um, if we go to um, Q4 2023, we're, we're sort of getting um, a smaller sample size, but it's still the same sort of story, like Perth is still coming along and Queensland is a perennial uh, informer, uh, per informer, performer. I should talk to my parole officer um, after these shows. Um, so, yeah, look, uh, as for the next state, it's a big crystal ball question. I, I don't think 2024 is necessarily about the next state. I think it's a continuation mm. of the current states. Like I don't think it's time to say South Australia or Victoria or Northern Territory. I mean, Northern Territory is a real wild card, right? Like it's the only sort of market that we kind of all agree is a bit too volatile to get involved in, right? Like people talk about, oh, you don't want to invest in Perth because it's just mining. Uh, there's there's a big component of mining, but it's bigger than just that. But in Northern Territory, you can have an LNG thing get up and running and it changes the whole market, right? So I don't think it's necessarily about the next state, but I, I do sort of see um, things getting to a point um, where Victoria reaches the bottom of the market. Um, we've seen really, really bad results from uh Tasmania and the ACT, and that just sort of can't last forever. Um, the employment fundamentals of the ACT are so strong, but the median house price is just crazy, right? Like, you know, so much yeah. higher than places like Brisbane. Um, and Hobart, you know, had that huge run, but it's still, you know, relatively affordable, although it really overtook um, WA. So, you know, if you're wanting to be sort of counterintuitive, you look to those soft markets. But I think uh, the long-term fundamentals for property within Australia in those diversified locations that have that mix of affordability and aren't perverted by too much investor involvement rather than owner rock, there's there's opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you read a big old white paper. Now, white papers, they're a scary, they're a scary word. Um, they've got papers already white. Why does it need to be double white? Um, about question. depreciation. There were a couple of changes in the industry. Um, one, can you give us a high level of what a depreciation report is and why we would need one as an investor? And what 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 are the changes and why again? Why should we care? <laughs> why should we care? Why should you care? It's a good it's a good question. Uh and I saw as recent as I think it was yesterday, someone saying, you know, what is a tax depreciation schedule? What does it actually do? Yeah. Um, you know, most of the people on this forum are relatively sophisticated, so they probably have many properties and they've done it before. But its job is to really just help you to pay less tax. So um, a naysayer would say, oh, you know, these, these investors, they're getting these tax handouts with these loopholes. They talk about negative gearing as a loophole. I'm pretty sure it came in in about 1936. Loopholes to me aren't things that have existed for 90 years in the light of day and brought up right. ad nauseum, right? Um, but what, what a depreciation schedule is, is it's we, we go and we do an inspection, we provide a construction cost estimate for the property when it was built, all of the improvements, and then the ATO gives you statutory rates where the property declines in value. So let's say you're renting out the property and you're getting thirty thousand dollars of uh, of rent, then that is that is income. You might then also have twenty thousand dollars worth of PM fees, so that puts you 
um, a 10 grand uh, positively geared, then you might have some repairs and maintenance at 15 and suddenly you're $5,000 behind. With tax depreciation, it's kind of like an on-paper loss as well. Um, so you might have, let's say, $11,000 worth of deductions. And the difference between um, $11,000 of deductions in a depreciation schedule for someone on, say, $100,000 is, is around about $3,800. You go from paying $24,000 in tax um, to a little over $20,000 in tax. So wow. the idea is just to help you pay less tax. But I, I should hazard to say um, it's not a strategy, it's a bonus. Don't go and buy a property because it's got the best deductions. It's a bonus and everyone should claim it. And the first time we crunched the data, we realised that $2.88 billion worth of deductions were being left on the table. That number has dropped to around about $700 million worth of deductions left on the on the table. That's still a significant amount that people aren't claiming because they think it might be too old or they think it's got to be this type of property. Um, people like me in, in our industry will give free advice. Um, as for the white paper, why is it white? Why do they call it white? I think it's a it's an egghead boffin university term just to make them um, sound cleverer than they are, perhaps. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so what actually happened is the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors put out a, a guideline paper for quantity surveyors and consumers. And there's all sorts of boring things like how much insurance should you have and that sort of thing. But there are there is some really good consumer advice. And it basically says that whilst there are circumstances where a site inspection is not required, they are likely to be quite rare. One good example is if you buy a brand new property or you build a brand new property and you know the construction costs and you have a set of plans and a schedule of finishes. Now, that does definitely happen, but it's r relatively uncommon. You know, that, that's probably only going to be 5 or 10% of the, of the homes that we do. Um, so what people are sort of saying is that they can use online resources or online information to do this, but um, the, the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors is, says that that can really open you up to uh, an audit and, worse than that, missing out on deductions right? And mm. that just keeps me up tonight. So that's, I think, an important thing for consumers because I can tell you that um, having employees across the country, being able to inspect everywhere in Australia is a big expense to our business. It's a big HR exercise. We need a lot of Toyota Corollas, for example. Um, <laughs> I don't even know how many we, we have. Well, we've got a Toyota 86. That's the MCG race car that I take out sometimes. Um, but, yeah, look, if, if we didn't have to do inspections, I'm not doing it for the fun. I'm doing it for the end result for the consumer. And at the end of the day, I want to spend my day feeling proud that I've done the best that I can with my knowledge. I wish I could save people's lives. I'm not clever enough to do that, but I can save people tax, right? And, you know, for some people Half that's good. as good. Well, there's... Yeah. <laughs> What's guaranteed? Death and taxes. If you attack both, if you attack at least one of those things, you're 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 in the good place with the big man upstairs. So, yeah, well, we we'll appreciate. See if you. we can solve death, and we've got the whole market covered. <laughs> That's 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 Jordan who said that as well, by the way. <laughs> Jordan right, listening to Mike in the background helps me write better emails. There you go. I don't. Is that a <laughs> is that a compliment or an insult? It's back, it's a back end compliment. <laughs> I, I, you know, Jordan is a champion bloke. Great hair, by the way. His his Fantastic. crab yeah. his crab pot fetish seems to be going out of hand. I think I saw a kayak with two crab pots on it. Um, turns he's sort of it's like that. It's always sunny in Philadelphia episode. We're crab people now. That's what I think of when I think of Jordan right now. But a champion bloke. I think he means it in good faith. <laughs> I think he means nothing but good. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> um, so, hang on. What do we get out of the white the paper? Are we are we, are we better yeah. off as no. investors or worse off as investors? Look, the requirement is that if a quantity surveyor is preparing a report without an inspection, the AIQS says, says that they need to explain to you why they chose to make that decision. Um, right. So there are quantity surveyors out there that are saying, we don't need to go to site, we can save you money, you know, it's a waste of time going out there, you're up, you upset the tenants, all that sort of stuff. And and really it's just kind of serving their uh, their personal goals. And, and look, right. there are certain so examples where... You have to get someone out there because that's what's going to give you the the true insight of okay this thing's got two years worth of wear it's got five eight years left of usable life 
that's a deduction that you can't just make by not not being there. Yeah, look, unless you unless you have been to an identical property or you've been to the property in the past and can certify nothing has changed or the exact construction costs are known for the property and specifically any uh, common areas, uh, then you need to get that inspection done. Love it. Well, has anyone got any kind of questions for our man and our data king, Mr. Mike Mortlock, MCG, Quantiva Surveying King? Um, can we call him, because this has been a super interesting prince of, one, mate. Prince of Data? Uh, that? I like that. It's, cause it's a bit like the Prince of Darkness. And I am in this purgatory that Joe was saying before. <laughs> and Prince sounds younger wow. too, and I do feel old. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I can you see, I can see the Facebook... Like I could see the Facebook comments, but I, it doesn't show me who it is. Doesn't but then tell I see, yes, is. three crabs this weekend. Come for lunch. I assume that's Jordan. That's going to be Jordan, that one. Yeah. Um, how would you prioritize? Oh, here we go. Here's a good good question. It's a bit of a tough one to answer. Um, I'll bring it up shortly because it's delayed. How would you prioritize data sources to reference and what should inform the fundamentals above all? Oh. That's a big Jesus. billion What are your dollar fundamental question. focus? What do you what do you kind of look for? Um, I mean, Sergey. we were talking about talking about some good ones before um, infrastructure and kind of what that yeah. means for a town. I, I think um, if I had to pick, probably the the number one, it's it's employment opportunities. People got to get paid. You know, like mm. uh, you you have to have money to purchase a property. You have, mon have to have money to satisfy a bank that you can borrow. You have to have an income to be able to rent a property. And, uh, you know, there's arguments that go all the way back to the 1920s that says, you know, housing is unaffordable. So I don't necessarily buy in into that. But certainly you ha you actually have to graft and you have to do something to be able to get into property. So I, I think where, where there are diverse uh, employers, where there are employment opportunities and expanding businesses and infrastructure spend, and there's a, there's a buzz around a, a community. And I think a population of a certain size always helps because there's uh, some inherent good fundamentals that come with that. that that's do you have a limit? The, What's your limit? Look, uh, I've been thinking about that a, a lot. Um, I don't know if I have a limit, but I like to be sort of looking around that 25, 30 plus thousand uh, for a location. Um, Jesus. I, That's not I very reserve... many places. Like, no. No, absolutely. It cuts it down, right? I don't know exactly how many that would be, but it's still probably like 100. Um no. But, yeah, look, I reserve the right to change that figure because I am still thinking about well, what is the, the magic figure. And I guess it just it depends. Like it's a bit like saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm single and I'm looking for my dream man and he's got to be six foot one. You know, like right. what a ridiculous thing. Like what, what if the best person on earth for you that's just five fundamentally matched you is 5'10"? Five, five, yeah, I think it's mm. a little bit stupid to say. I won't look at this size. And then, you you know, that's the danger in setting those filters, filter by yeah. this, filter by that, and you just miss yeah. out by 1% because you were too hard and fast. I think you can go a little that's bit what, crazy. That's what that's that's what Jeremy Shepard said. He sort of said, oh, yes, it's good to have, like, I, I would, and I sort of changed the way because I used to be like, oh, you know, it's got to be 5.2% yield. And and then if something's 5.1, that automatically knocked out. I'm like, oh, well, I'll just consider that that doesn't quite meet that threshold. What does oh, the rest it's, of the criteria say? That's like twenty dollars a week, right? To move move from yeah, from but... five point one to five point two is is twenty dollars. Well, do you really want to give up sixty? I had this conversation today. I was chatting with with somebody, yeah. an investor, and I'm like, look, this this clearly has sixty thousand dollars in it. Clearly, we've here's the comparables. This is where this stacks up at this. I know the rent doesn't hit our threshold of uh, four point eight. Uh, sorry, five point two percent yield. It's four point one two. Hmm. Are you willing to give up sixty thousand dollars for twenty dollars a week or whatever it was? And then we did the math. It was twenty times by fifty-two. That's a thousand dollars, right? That's a thousand dollars to give up sixty thousand. What do you want mm. to do? Like it's it's ridiculous. So yeah, I think it's having that Lucy, like not Lucy. Uh, call him Magic Mike. Well, we do. We do off <laughs> off camera. We do definitely. Um, I think Sam Gordon started that, and he's trying real hard to make sure it sticks. It's working. 
it's working. The we'll harder you push fast, back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I don't Mike. have the abs to pull it off, but um, yeah, I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> I take it. How do we learn more about you, Mike, and uh, what you're doing over there at MCG? Well, you can follow me on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and we share lots and lots of data that I think answers some of those questions. You know, where do we get this? How do we find that sort of stuff? And, you know, I'm dedicated to, to giving as much as I can back to, to our clients and, and potential clients and anyone that's an aspirational person that wants to, you know, invest in their financial future. So that's the easiest way to do it. You can go, yeah, there's a little website link or just get me on the socials. And, and once you sort of connect to me just be aware it is hard to get away i people tell me i am everywhere like how how did i see you here there yesterday and now you're here so just just be forewarned there's about 10 mics running around the world That's and right. for growth as well check out the <laughs> yeah yeah i've been cloned um, i've actually even made it made a, a chat gpt of, of myself so it's going to get worse jesus um but depreciation schedules um i like them if they don't if they don't cover the cost, you don't do them. So mm. I'm that, all for it. That's point one of the due diligence. Is it going to cost you more than you get back? If the answer is yes, mm. we'll see you on the next one. You know, here's why it didn't stack. But it doesn't yeah. mean it's not a good investment. And, and it happens. And those people tend to appreciate that we're not just trying to take money for them. And then when they come back, they're like, what about this one? I'm like, this one I'll charge you for. And they're like, yay. <laughs> yeah, because we'll get a return. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I have that same conversation with, with people all the time. It's like, look, you know, what are the deduc deductions on this? Now, speak with a quantity surveyor, but based on the age of this thing, it's 30, 40 years old. You, you, there's not as many as if it's brand new off the plan. But a brand new off the plan is not going to give you those returns that you need in terms of capital growth. Um, so, yeah, you got to be got to be careful on that. Um, super insightful session mate i love the data i i love that i like it kind of makes me feel comfortable with with 2024 you you see it being pretty much the same not the not the same obviously but there's the, there's no boom here boom there it's going to completely change and shift um but just uh be, be a little wary of some areas and and think through <laughs> the, the fundamentals we'll just see if this age as well um if <laughs> There's we'll a few certain it. countries we'll that could invade otherwise. certain places. Yeah, just delete it. But yeah, 2023, <laughs> uh, that aged fairly well. I'm happy with that. And and yeah, we'll see. But we'll people, see. If, if you thanks for coming on, Mike. I really appreciate you taking the time, your hour and a half. Of course. I think you you have an early morning meeting tomorrow. So, but no, if you've gotten some heaps of value from this, drop us a rating and review on Spotify, all that good sort of stuff, and check Mike out and check us all out. And I'll, I'm going to pass over to Joe. Yeah, check us all out. <laughs> I'll just go buy a property. See you I'll guys. Later. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I'll jump in the comments too for anyone I missed. Thanks, guys. Always Legend. fun. <laughs>